Good morning, students. I'm Mr. Boscarini, and for our unit on forces, today we're going to talk about Newton's third law of motion. Now, this is the last video of this series um, about forces, and especially we're going to look at the third and last law of motion of Newton's. Uh, so today we're going to see how forces always comes in pairs. We're going to see how um, in a given situation we can identify action-reaction pairs, but most interesting, we're going to see how uh, rocket engines work. So for, for once, we're really going to look into rocket science. The basic principle of Newton's third law of motion is that you cannot touch without being touched. Every time you apply a force on an object, that object will apply the same force on you, just in the opposite direction. Forces will always come in pairs. Now, it's really, really important, though, that you have to understand that every time we have an action-reaction pair, uh, each one of the two forces are acting on different objects. So, um, let's look at this example. Now, uh, we've seen before the case where we have uh, someone kicking a ball. Now, so I, we can have our um, football shoe, we have a football, and we have a force. No? And we can say foot is kicking the ball. So it's applying a forward force. Up to now, this is what we have studied. But now, uh, and it's also based on our experience. Now, every time you kick something, you feel something on, on your foot. And what is that? That is the same force you're applying on the ball, just in the opposite direction. So what we can say is just taking this sentence, foot is kicking ball, and reverse it and saying that the ball is kicking the foot, which might sound a bit silly, but is exactly what is happening. There is an action and reaction pair. The foot touches the ball, the ball touches the foot. Exactly for this reason, especially a higher level physics, we prefer to refer to forces, not as forces, but as interactions. Because they're all, it's, it, it underlies the principle that uh, forces always happen between two objects. And if one object applies a force on another object, the other force, the other object will in turn apply the same force, but in the opposite direction to the first object. Of course, I couldn't leave you without citing the original words by Sir Isaac Newton, whom, as you know, uh, wrote his famous book, in Latin. So let's look at the wording from Newton. Um, Actioni contrarium semper et equalem este reactionem. And I think you can here sort of identify the words action and reaction. Equal means equal, no? And contrary. So it says um, to each action there's, uh, all, there's always semper and equal an opposite reaction. Siver corporum duorum actiones in se mutuo semper esser equales et in partes contrarias dirigere. Again, it's, um, it's saying that these two forces are acting in the opposite direction. Now it's time to see a more modern version of the same law. And again, depending on which textbook you look, you will find different ways of formulating the same idea. So, well, I'm going to show you two possible formulations. This is the more extensive one, the one I prefer. Um, so if object A exerts, remember this means apply a force on object B, then Object B will exert on object A, oh, I have a typo here, a force equal in magnitude, so with the same size, but in the opposite direction. Um, a shorter version of the same sentence, which is usually the one that most people remember, is the one that says, to every action corresponds an equal but opposite reaction. 
For this reason, Newton's third, um, third law of motion is um, more universally known as the law of action and reaction. Now, this law has some very interesting implications, especially when we have two objects which are very, very different in size. That means very, very different in mass. So let's imagine you have our astronaut here. Now you see floating in space, and he has this brilliant idea. He wants to push away an asteroid. Well, it's quite a small asteroid, but you have to think this is all made of rock. So it's definitely way more massive than our astronaut. So how does this work? The astronaut is applying a force, as you can see, you're represented with an arrow, right? so it's giving us the direction. Um, I'm putting the tail of the arrow at the point where the force is applied, and the size of the arrow gives me more or less an idea on the uh, magnitude of my force. But now I know that because of Newton's third law, the asteroid in turn will apply the same force, a force with the same size, and as you can see, I have two arrows of the same length, just to represent that, but in the opposite direction. And now comes into play the factor of mass, because now we have two forces which are equal but opposite, on two very, very different sized objects. So let's look visually what this means. Now, I represented the mass of the asteroid with a big M, just to say, wow, this is a really big number. So uh, as far uh, as much as our asteroid is strong, can apply a big force, what will happen, we have a, a, a number divided by a very, very big number. So what will happen? Yes, the asteroid will accelerate, but that acceleration will be very small. On the other hand, the same force applied on the relatively small mass of our astronaut will produce a much bigger effect. And I, I emphasize this with using this big A here. So to summarize, uh, the astronaut is effectively pushing the asteroid. What will be the effect is that the asteroid will be pushed away from, so what you will see will really be the movement of this asteroid away from the asteroid. And finally, as promised, we're going to look at very briefly at rocket science, or be more precise, the science behind the way a normal rocket works. And what I have here, it's probably the, one of the most famous rockets ever built, one of the first rockets ever built, the V2, uh, rocket, uh, which is, was basically a flying bomb developed by Werner von Braun, which was the na Nazi scientist, which later became the head of the American space program. And this rocket was used during the Battle of England to bomb London and other cities. And the design, as you can see, is very simple, yet is exactly the same design which is used even nowadays for rockets. And the first thing that should strike you is that a rocket is mostly made of fuel tanks. Uh, what you carry with your rocket is just this tiny, tiny portion on the top. This is the payload. Most of the rest of the rocket is made of fuel tanks. And normally a rocket will have two separate fuel tanks. So the what makes a rocket fly is uh, the mixture of two components. In the case of a V2 rocket was um, a mixture of alcohol and water in this upper tank and liquid oxygen in the lower tank. And what happened, you had a, a mixture of these two gases in the combustion chamber. So where really the chemical reaction that powers the rocket happens. At this point, you have the production of a lot of high pressure gas that is pushed downward. So you see, I'm representing this with this um, orange arrow. The rocket pushes the gases down. Although actually it's just the gases, they, they find the only way to escape is through the nozzle here. This is what we can call the action. So we have the gases which are pushed down and those ga gases 
in return they apply the same force this green arrow but in the opposite direction on the rocket and this is what we will call the reaction and the, the great thing of this kind of propulsion and it works everywhere you don't need an atmosphere like um, in propeller place you need to have a propeller you need of course also um, a, so you need um, air through which the propeller can can push our um, now in class we're going to see this a little bit more in detail we're going to see in general how to identify um, action and reaction pairs uh, but today that is all goodbye from Mr. Wisconsin.